Don't change the code. My delegation, my wife and I stepped, stepped on the soil of this United States. Once more, we were received with overwhelming attributes of friendship and solidarity. It is clear, beyond any reasonable doubt, that the unbending of our organization came as a result of the pressures exerted upon the appointed regime by yourselves. I want to tell you that Oakland is the last city that I am visiting in the course of my tour. Let me assure you that despite my 71 years, at the end of this visit, I feel like a young man of 35. It is you, the people of Oakland, the people of the Bay Area, who have given me and my delegation strength and hope to go back and continue the struggle. You must remember that you are our blood brothers and sisters. You are our comrades in the struggle. Remember that we respect you. We admire you, and above all, we love you all. Thank you. Thank you. I was there that day, in person. I was 17, and the Oakland Coliseum, of all places, in Oakland, California, was Nelson Mandela's final stop on a tour of the United States that he took upon his release from prison after 27 years. This was less than six months after he was freed from prison. He's in his 70s. He'd not been free in decades. And he took this exhausting tour. And you would not think of the Bay Area and Oakland as being must-do stops on that kind of a tour. But Nelson Mandela, upon getting out of prison, made a specific point of traveling to Oakland, California, because Oakland, California, and Berkeley, and San Francisco all had passed municipal policies that insisted on divesting stock from any company that did business in South Africa. Even the longshoremen at the West Coast ports had, in California had, had refused to unload South African goods coming into the ports of the Bay Area, all in protest of the apartheid system, all to try to support the fight against it in South Africa, all to try to pressure the apartheid government to give up. And so... Nelson Mandela came all the way to Oakland to say thank you for doing that. It mattered. It is part of why I am free, and it's part of why apartheid is ending. And that decision about divestment was not an uncontroversial one in American politics at the time. President Ronald Reagan was vehemently opposed to that strategy. He and British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher actively opposed sanctions against the apartheid regime. Margaret Thatcher went so far as to call Nelson Mandela a terrorist, but that's another story. But under Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, the United States and the United Kingdom both voted at the U.N. to block international sanctions against the South African regime. Despite their opposition, though, by the late 1980s, there was enough public momentum in favor of blocking trade to South Africa. There was enough public momentum in favor of it that the U.S. Congress passed something called the Comprehensive Anti-Apartheid Act in 1986. It banned all new investment in South Africa. It blocked the importing of most South African goods. And President Reagan was vehemently against it. He went so far as to use his presidential veto to try to stop it. 
Mr. Reagan on Friday vetoed a bill that imposes economic sanctions on South Africa. The bill limits U.S. investment in South Africa and bans U.S. imports of South African uranium, coal, steel, and agricultural products. Mr. Reagan is opposed to the sanctions, but he must convince at least 20 senators to change their positions if the veto is to be sustained. Both sides say that is unlikely. President Reagan's veto was not sustained. It was overridden by an overwhelming vote in both the House and the Senate, including many, many, many members of his own Republican Party. It was the first override of a presidential veto on a foreign policy issue in the century. And anti-apartheid leaders credit those sanctions and credit the private divestment movement around the United States and around the world with bringing about the pressure and the isolation that was necessary to eventually humble the apartheid regime, to humble the ruling South African government and bring them to the negotiations that eventually freed Nelson Mandela and brought an end to the apartheid system. The fight here to do that was nothing compared to the fight in South Africa, but politically it was a heck of a fight here too. Joining us now is former California congressman and former Oakland mayor Ron Dellums. He was the sponsor of the 1986 Anti-Apartheid Act. Congressman Dellums, it's nice to see you. Thank you very much for being here. It's my honor to be here. I'm one of your great fans, my friend. Well, thank you. Well, tell me what led you to sponsor the Anti-Apartheid Act uh, in 1986. A little known fact in history is that a group of African-American employees of the Polaroid uh, company, which took pictures uh, that were in the past books of black South Africans during the apartheid regime, were inspired by the organization of the Congressional Black Caucus in late 1971. They came down to Washington, D.C. because they were concerned about trying to make a statement of divestment of Polaroid and its partnership uh, in the uh, apartheid, cooperation in the apartheid effort. The Congressional Black Caucus asked me to meet with these folks. I met with them. And we agreed to put a piece of legislation together, and I kept reintroducing it for 15 years and fought every day for 15 years until we finally got it passed by the House of Representatives. But it was a small group of militant Polaroid workers who had the courage and the vision to help begin that process. When the other side in this American political fight argued against you, when when Ronald Reagan's side argued that instead they wanted engagement, that divestment would hurt the very people who you were trying to help, and it would hurt black South Africans more than anybody because they were economically disadvantaged, how did you rebut those arguments? Why did you eventually win such an overwhelming vote? Because people understood that if if the folks who were feeling the oppression were the ones arguing for disinvestment, and they were. South Africans were arguing for divestment. Black South Africans, activists, were arguing for disinvestment. And so what we did was simply put into legislative form the screams of the people in South Africa who were feeling the pain and the activists in this country coming out of the civil rights movement who understood that pain and were willing to stand with them. So we said, how can you from the outside make such a tragic argument? It was the moral imperative that eventually overcame these folks. And what, what, to what degree do you think divestment and those sanctions ended up being a tipping point in South Africa. How important did it end up being in conjunction with all the work that was, of course, being done by anti-apartheid activists there and around the world? A German journalist came to Washington, D.C. several years later, said that he had done a great deal of research. His research indicated that F. Edward de Klerk and Margaret Thatcher had a conversation. F. Edward de Klerk said to her, what do you think I should do? Her response was, the Dellums bill passed on a voice vote two years ago. It passed again on a record vote this year. Now the Democrats control the Senate. It will pass the Senate. It, this investment will become the law of the land. His response was, so what should I do? Her response was, free Mandela and begin to negotiate a new South Africa while you have leverage. Because if disinvestment becomes the law of, of the United States with cooperation around the world, you will have no leverage. And so he said, tell Mr. Dellums that while his bill never became law, 
it hung over South Africa like the sword of Damocles. Wow. Former California Congressman Ron Dellums, uh, thank you very much for helping us understand this history on this night of all nights, sir. Uh, it's, it's invaluable to have your perspective here. Thank you so much. It's my honor, my friend. Thank you. All right. Dan Rather is going to join us next. We'll be right back. Stay with us. At the end, the bloodletting stopped. At the end, goodwill prevailed. At the end, the overwhelming majority, both black and white, decided to invest in peace.